So, ever so quickly, because you didn't come to see me, I just want to say that uh, today is really important for us because at the Resource Alliance, um, we're very much, as, as you know, if you know anything about our organisation, it's about working on capacity building, building sustainability, and being there as a global thought tank, really, for making sure that the industry, the NGO sector, has that level of understanding and that level of togetherness to actually develop, to grow, and to become the sort of force that the that civil society has to be to be making a different world today. And leadership is such an important part of that. Understanding what is good leadership, what is bad leadership, how should leadership look, and how as leaders in, in society should we be developing our own sectors and communities as a whole. We have an incredible panel today. We're going to be leading the discussions and talking, and uh, really, really pleased. And thank you so much to each and every one of you for joining us. Um, I'm going to introduce you to the gentleman who's going to chair today. Um, in the middle, Andy uh, White, who uh, comes to us um, Andy is currently founder of the Inspiration Bureau, and prior to that has a, an incredible background in fundraising, uh, which is all in your programme, and I'm sure Andy may say a little bit more about that for you. But if I can hand you over to Andy, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stephen, and thank you all for coming uh, very early this morning. Um, from battling cancer to conquering the cat walk, what does real leadership uh, look like? Uh, this morning we have an inspired uh, panel of speakers, um, and we're going to very quickly get onto them, so don't worry, I'm not going to talk for much longer, um, and really listen to some great insight we're going to have um, on informing and inspiring, actually, uh, what is great leadership today, uh, not only in the sector, but um, beyond that. Um, thank you very much for the introduction, Stephen. I'm Andy White, so I'm fan of the Inspiration Bureau, uh, and I, we have a very clear mission, actually, just trying to inform and inspire people. Let's face it, that's what we all do in our lives anyway, that we have to go out there and, and inform and inspire people. And we've got four great speakers who are going to uh, help us do that. Um, each speaker will be speaking for around uh, no more than 10 minutes, please. Thank you. Um, and then after that, we'll have an opportunity for questions and answers. <coughs> so without further ado, let me introduce our first speaker, Andrew Hind, the CB, formerly uh, Chief Executive, and I'm right in saying the first Chief Executive of yep. the Charity Commission, yep. uh, current editor of Charity Finance, um, also a professor, at the uh, Cass Business School and uh, City University in London, and uh, is also on the board of the Information Commissioner. Pauses for a boot. No, we are kind of out, really. Right. Uh, a trustee at the Bering Foundation, uh, and also uh, leading roles in the BBC World Service. Uh, for those of you in the sector, uh, are you still a judge on the charity? Yes, I am. Let me just say that again. He's still a judge. A uh, chairman of the panel of the charity awards, the Civil Society Charity Awards. Um, also, uh, previously, leading roles at ActionAid, Bernardo's, UNICEF UK. Um, so I think you'll agree with me. I'm pleased to welcome, welcome men to say a few words for us now, Andrew. An influential and key role in the civil society for the last 25 years. Andrew. Thank you very much. Very daunting intro out there, <laughs> um, And it's great to be here and have the opportunity to, to talk about this this morning because uh, we've all been given a blank canvas to paint on, and we will all paint different pictures. Uh, and the reason for that is, I'm sure what you already know, there is no one easy definition or key to what effective and great leadership looks or feels like. <clears throat> um, but I hope that you'll take something away from what I say in the same way as you'll take, I'm sure, something away from what everyone else says. Um, the other reason it's so great to be here is that, in addition to the various things that I've done over the years that Andy mentioned, I was a trustee of the Resource Alliance in the 90s, in the days when it was still called the International Fundraising Workshop. And actually, one of the most important organisations in civil society then and still today, because exactly as Stephen said, um, creating leadership in emerging countries uh, and helping to build effective civil society is a really important uh, role, I think, for everybody wherever they are engaged in, in these great sectors of ours. Now, what does real leadership look like? Well, I've always believed that a fundamental guiding principle of leadership in our sector is to remember that we are all merely the temporary custodians of the organisations we work for. Um, I think we've got the responsibility of handing over our organisations stronger than when we found them. And the key thing for me is that the organisation 
is the fixture, not the leader. Sometimes in what can be a power craze world, not just in the business sector, but in the civil society sector as well, unfortunately, uh, one would be forgiven for thinking that the NGO or the charity is the servant of the leader rather than the other way around. Um, in the end, I think successful leadership requires a mix of both professional and social or interpersonal competencies. It's a mixture of the heart and the head. Um, Andy talked about inspiring people. Of course, the ability to inspire is absolutely first on the list, I think, that we would all put of any successful leader. But just because someone can inspire and engage hearts, it doesn't mean they can necessarily lead, but certainly doesn't mean they can lead in a sustainable way over the long term. Um, and I learned that lesson in the first charity I worked for, my big breakthrough in the sector was when I was appointed to be the finance director of Action Aid in the mid-1980s. And the chief exec in those days was a young, very energetic American called Roland Hodgson, known as Rip. Uh, to everyone. And his leadership style was larger than life. He was hugely charismatic and he taught me that being a leader does mean being out in front and having the courage of your convictions. And I still think that is a non-negotiable aspect to leadership. You can't lead a civil society organisation if you don't put your heart and soul out there on the line. So passion, conviction, belief, I think they are all vital qualities in a leader. But if they aren't balanced by the interpersonal skills and the social competencies that I mentioned, such as the ability to understand your colleagues' own capacity to make progress, then those qualities of passion and conviction and belief can actually become a source of frustration both to the leader personally and to the organisation as a whole. And that's what happened to Rip Hodgson and Action Aid in the early 90s because Rip had phenomenal drive and vision. The classic fundamental prerequisites in successful leaders. And it meant that he wanted to keep moving faster than his colleagues had the ability to follow. So that kind of... <laughs> connection between the leader out front and the organisation was like a piece of elastic and it became increasingly stretched until eventually the elastic broke because Rick wanted new development programmes in new countries all the time. He wanted a new IT system tomorrow, he wanted new measures uh, of impact even in the 1980s we were having that developed and instead of being inspired we all became exhausted and then we became demotivated and Rick didn't have the interpersonal skills to see that. A leader without followers is no longer a leader. Um, so what I learned about leadership from that period is that it is not in the end all about that one person. It's about the leader constructing what you might call a coalition of the willing, a group of people, as large as possible, willing to sign on to the changes required, willing to go the extra mile, and willing to take on the mantle of leadership themselves. Because that's the other important thing about leadership in our sector. Leaders can be found and need to be found at all levels, in all professional disciplines, and coming from all backgrounds. And one of the best and most effective leaders I ever worked with wasn't the CEO, wasn't a fundraising director or an FD. She didn't have a high flying career, she hadn't been to INSEAD or Harvard. And this was when I was working at Bernardo's in the late 90s. The standout leader I remember 20 years later from those days was a woman who had been brought up in a Bernardo's residential care home in the old days of institutionalised care. Uh, and she was actually a non-executive trustee of Bernardo's. And the experience of her life meant that she had a grip and a 
grasp on the core of Bernardo's mission and what it meant in reality that was second to none. And combined with her natural emotional intelligence, that enabled her to help shape strategic debates around the Bernardo's board table in a more effective way than all the impressive people with business backgrounds and professional qualifications that were surrounding her. So, the street fundraiser, the volunteer home visitor, the, ad the admin manager in the HR department, these are all potential leaders, and they have the ability to influence the attitude and performance of everybody around them. So, if the directors at the top in any organisation are to be successful corporate leaders, I think they have to find a way to involve and inspire colleagues at all levels, to get those colleagues to demand a sense of ownership in the charity's future direction and success. And in that way, an organisation finds that it doesn't just have one leader, but it has dozens of leaders, or in a very large NGO, it has hundreds of leaders. What do corporate leaders need to do to achieve that promised land? Well, um, this is the only slide I want to show you. These are two of my favourite leaders operating in UK civil society today. On the left is Sue Sayer. She's the chief exec of United Response. And she actually defi defies all the rules of leadership because she founded United Response 42 years ago and she is still the leader, and I think she is inspiring and delivering change and effective charitable outcomes every day. But the organisation has always been bigger than she is. And on the right is David Nussbaum, and David is a brilliant leader as well. He was the finance director in Oxfam about 20 years ago. He then went to Germany and he was the chief executive of Transparency International for quite a long time, and he's now chief executive of WWF UK. Uh, and these two embody how I want to finish because uh, I think they have passion and conviction so they've really got the heart they've got really good analytical abilities which is the head they command respect they make it clear to their colleagues that they don't have a monopoly of good ideas they're risk takers rather than risk avoiders they're very brave personally when the going gets tough, they put themselves on the line. But most of all, they've shown a willingness to be vulnerable. And I think to be a really good leader, you have to show a willingness and an ability to be vulnerable because you are not uh, able to get everything right the whole time. Humility and an ability to admit one got it wrong are, in my view, more important leadership characteristics than the headline grabbing tales of contracts won, double-digit fundraising growth, and competitors put to the sword, which so often pass for outstanding leadership uh, competencies in our sector these days. In the end, I think the ultimate test of a leader is to construct a culture and to construct a team which is going to guarantee an effective organisation long after you, the leader, has left. So, I hope I'll give just about inside 10 minutes, Andy. That's my That's on. Thank you very much down. indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're going to get an opportunity to uh, you to ask questions of uh, Andrew and the other speakers, just once everyone's had a chance to speak. Um, just to, uh, some things I'd just like to pull out of your, your piece there, Andrew, if I may. There's a lovely uh, statement you made right at the start about kind of leaving things in a better place when you first arrived. And, and I've been privileged just chatting to a few people over coffee. We've actually got a quite a few founders in this room today. Um, and I always think when you're near, near a founder, I'm leading into an introduction by the way in a second, but when you're, when you're near a founder, there's a founder factor in the room. Um, and you know exactly what I mean, but you actually, there's somebody that just inspires you with a, a personal humility, which Andrew mentioned, but also a determination uh, to get things wrong. And actually an honesty, uh, an honesty as well, that they don't know everything and they need a team around them to help them achieve the vision of what they have as a founder. So thank you much indeed, Andrew. I'd like to move on to our, our second speaker now, uh, Justina Mutali, uh, founder of Positive Runway.
and a previous African Woman of the Year, actually 2012. Um, is an ambassador for gender equality and a spokesperson for the International Women's Think Tank. Is a top 100 change maker. I shall still keep going because she was just telling me that later on this month she's going to New York um, to go to the United Nations to be appointed uh, a global African goodwill ambassador. Wow! Yeah, so she is a philanthropist, she's a humanitarian, and Justina also sits on the advisory board to the World Leaders Forum. I just remind you, we're here to talk about leadership. We've got some great people on the panel today. Um, you're a patron, I know you're an ambassador, uh, and you're an inspiring woman. Ladies and gentlemen, our second speaker, Christina. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Uh, thank you, I had to move from there and I got to stay seated because I had, um, I had a PowerPoint that gives the skeleton of what I'm talking about. But like Andrew said, we have been given a blank, um, a blank canvas on which to paint what we think of leadership. I decided that I'll base my presentation on the idea that NGOs are the new super brands and as such there is the need for NGOs to stay relevant in a volatile global environment. This is, for me, my presentation is based on what NGOs should look for in order to stay ahead of the game, in order to, what NGO leaders should look for in order for us to stay relevant to what's happening in the world and in order for us to be able to deliver what we need to do. To, to do that, I'll start with, um, by giving you just a glimpse into my own early years personal leadership journey. My early years were spent in a Catholic co-education school. I joined the Brownies, as some of you would know who might have been to a Catholic school, the Girl Guides and the Cadets. And my finishing school, instead of going to Switzerland, at the age of 17, was spent in military training. You will find that the military is an institution that has no respect for gender. In the military, one gets respected for their hard work, focus, leadership, and authority. Whether you are a man or woman is of no consequence. I found that a Catholic core education, the Brownies, Girl Guides, Cadets, and military training taught me to consider myself equal to the other gender. It also taught me to always be prepared, just like the Bible teaches us about being prepared for the day of judgment. This does not mean simply being prepared for God to judge you when you die. It means being fully prepared and adequately armed for life's eventualities, both positive and negative. It was in those early years, ladies and gentlemen, that I learned the importance of preparedness, ultimate discipline, precision, initiative, focus, diligence, perseverance, endurance, and resilience. This is where I learned to aim at a target and to shoot the bull's eye. You could call that setting your, your goals and targets and getting them. I also learned how to lead a platoon into battle and to actually win the war. That is to be a leader. And now that I'm older, I realize that these are the same traits that are required for one to succeed in life and to be a leader. My organization, Positive Runway, runs a worldwide HIV AIDS response campaign. Through the Global Catwalk, we aim to deliver the HIV message in a discourse appropriate to the 21st century generation. In working with the global community and young people, we have to deal with varying cultures, behaviors, attitudes, traditions, and beliefs of a diverse group of people who work with us across the globe. Working with young people in their best cultures poses a lot of its own challenges. And in running Positive Runway, as leaders, we try to focus on some of the key attributes of inspirational leadership, some of which will cross-cut into my early years of training, as well as most of the NGO sector leadership needs. For example, moral integrity, setting clear principles, morals and values, and beliefs that guide decisions, choices, and actions. Going beyond self-actualization and personal development to benefit others. Self-discipline in achieving physical and mental health. 
and overall well-being to help maintain emotional balance. You will realize that a healthy leader is infectious and inspires others to desire to work with them. Staying open to learning new things and to learn from others. To apply new knowledge and make decisions beyond and, and make decisions based on some judgment and wisdom so that you may attain your desired results. And also being aware and understanding how others feel. To relate well with others and to manage and control your own emotions to cope with demands, problems and pressures. This is sometimes called emotional, high emotional intelligence. Also having the ability to recover and learn from setbacks. Cultivating the ability to possibly cope with disappointment, crisis and catastrophe. Also to, to strive to uphold the reputation of your brand as the brand, the brand reflect, reflects the reputation, image, quality of work and impact on the community and society that you serve. It is also important that you leave a legacy by enhancing people's lives and making a sustainable difference that adds real value to people's lives. I forgot to mention when I told you about my early years that when I was young, I wanted to be a nun or a priest. I wanted to serve God and to serve and serve humanity to feed the hungry and to comfort the poor and save the sinners from burning in hell. Well, life happened and here I am in the NGO sector trying to save humanity from a life of hell on earth. As the primary voices of social, economic and environmental justice and deliverers of innovative service to vulnerable people, I believe that most of the key attributes of inspirational leadership would apply across the NGO sector. NGOs have an ethos that puts social and environmental issues above political and economic imperatives. As NGOs, we must strive to make a difference in ways that government and business cannot, as we are required to reach out to excluded communities, to provide innovative solutions to new problems that society faces every day. Dubbed as the new super brands, it is critical that NGOs, as NGOs, we need to protect our brand reputation by staying relevant and alert to the constantly changing dynamics of the global landscape in the political, economic, social, technological, and environmental landscape. As NGOs, we need to be politically sharp and stay alert to emerging challenges and priorities in order to efficiently navigate through the ever-changing, through the ever-changing environment if we are to realize our goals as effective agents in leading social change on the local, national, and global agenda. Sorry, I might have missed something there. But uh, <clears throat> I think we need to create a culture of learning. And to stay relevant and alert, NGOs should cultivate a culture of lifelong learning to constantly upgrade our skills and update ourselves on the prevailing global climate, on economic, political, social, technological, and environmental issues. And I believe that one of the best practices in this area would be the Resource Alliance Future Leaders Program, which explores the demands of leadership and the skills required to lead effectively with sensitivity to the needs of the NGO sector and the people that they serve. Global issues have a huge impact. Global issues have a huge impact on the work of NGOs, which often results in an expanded role in leading social change. The United Nations Secretary General's report on the post-2015 development goals declares that the post-2015 agenda must ensure the equal rights of women and girls and their full participation in the political, economic and public spheres. 
we all realize that for, decade, for decades, women have been involved in international development efforts, serving as participants, professionals, volunteers, and activists. And yet within these efforts, women continue to be denied access to leadership positions. To remain relevant and alert, NGOs should engage women at all levels, from decision-making process right through to project delivery and management. As stated by renowned economist Amatya Sen, nothing, arguably, is as important today in the political economy of development as an adequate recognition of political, economic, and social participation and leadership of women. It can therefore be argued that strong development and women's empowerment are intrinsically bound in everything from economic growth, access to education, food and health security to the environment, and peace building and good governance. And yet, of the people who live in extreme poverty around the world, most are women. Women do two-thirds of the world's work and produce half of the world's food. They earn only 10% of the world's income and are too often do not have enough to eat. And when women go ahead, not only are their interests underrepresented, but their valuable skills, ingenuity, resilience, and knowledge are unused. Raising women's voices, increasing their influence, and making decision-making more accountable to women are needed to overcome poverty and hunger and to ensure sustainable development. I believe that when perspectives of both men and women are taken into account, policies are more likely to enable access to opportunities and have inclusive outcomes. One of the reasons you find that um, hinder women from attaining leadership roles is a lack of appropriate education, training, knowledge transfer, and leadership development. One of the big good practices from the NGOs, I would say, is from the Royal Society of Arts through its Diaspora Changemakers program, in which they are working with the Comic Relief, Com Comic Relief Common Grounds Initiative. They have organized a Women Leadership and Change program, which offers courses to diaspora women to equip them with the necessary leadership skills for them to effectively manage leadership roles. We live now in an age of austerity, as we keep hearing on the TV, what our uh, politicians are telling us you find that while putting an increased demand from service users on NGOs decreased reserves, the age of austerity has created a triple impact on NGOs. As a result of reduced funding and investment from both the public and private sector, as NGOs, we need to be resilient under such circumstances by forming cross-sector partnerships that bring people and groups together around one cause, to form coalitions working with private, public sector, and special interest groups, and integrating local partners as equals rather than competing for scarce resources. A best practice of this would be the Disaster Emergence Committee, which brought together NGOs, the community, as well as the private sector to tackle the flood disaster. I am also proud to mention here that my organization, Positive Runway, was part of the coalition of over 200 UK development organizations and charities that Bond put together to run the EVE campaign, for which I acted as diaspora ambassador. There are a lot of emerging issues and priorities and challenges that uh, NGOs need to be alert to, but I'll just mention a few. Talk about of the agenda in the streams that I've been uh, working with are uh, the role of the diaspora, migration, and Africa. There is an accelerated need for diaspora organization to be involved in exclusive development. I have also just returned from the Global Forum on Migration and Development, which was held in Sweden. The forum is working with the United Nations, its member governments, NGOs, and diaspora organizations to advocate for migration to be included as a priority in the post-2015 Sustainable Development Agenda. 
And also, as Africa becomes home to some of the fastest growing economies, African governments and their people are beginning to reassert themselves to demand a review of the way in which NGOs portray the continent. To address this as a best practice, Afford convened a conference on the role of the media in Africa's rising. While Bond organized a conference titled Change the Record, in which we need to change the messages that go through the media in order to help Africa. Finally, it is important that we are sensitive to the cultures and beliefs of the people that we serve. Insufficient research in most cases has led to undesirable results for both the NGOs and the people we intend to help. The simple concept of matching needs with resources must be applied to collaborative efforts of NGOs. For example, I'll give, there are so many examples, but I just flag out the ones for my country, Zambia. A donation by an NGO of second-hand clothes in Zambia totally crippled the local textile industry in the country, which had an adverse effect on the economy of Zambia. And also, a few years ago, there, were, there was famine in some of the remote areas of Zambia, in the rural areas. And as good people, and part of the ONGO, I could say, the United Nations Food Program donated bags of rice. And the villagers turned around and reject, rejected the rice, saying, we do not eat this kind of food. The following day, headlines in the newspapers read, proud beggars. Thank you. <laughs> I really didn't think I was going to hear proud beggars today, so thank you, Richard. <laughs> He's um, interesting. Um, we we're, were talking before about the, um, the power of stories, and actually, you've told a very powerful story there. And I've, there's one point I just want to pull out was the, the point when you're saying about aiming for the bullseye and moving it. It sounds for everything you're doing, you're constantly moving the target. Yeah, it's kind of it's getting further back, and the challenges are getting bigger. So, um, well done for keeping that going. And I think the follow me analogy about the, your military background is, is really important in this as well. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Um, I'd like to move on to our third speaker now, uh, David Milton. David was until Friday the head of fundraising at the Association of International Cancer Research. He hasn't left because we're going to hear in a minute that actually they've reformed into a much more exciting title, if I can say that, David, yeah. without you. Yeah, okay, that's good. Um, started his career in fundraising at Child Reach International and drove both the brand and income uh, significantly up to make. Um, to make that charity the largest student fundraising charity in the UK. In 2010, David was acknowledged uh, at the Institute of Fundraising as the best and up-and-coming fundraiser. I think you're on Britain's Got Talent, are you as well? No, is that no? Not yeah. That's good, that's good. Uh, I became, um, <coughs> and uh, became a director of fundraising at Childrens at the same time. Uh, David now leads the fundraising team at uh, an amazing charity and is uh, currently spearheading the Smarty Pants campaign, which will change the face of uh, fundraising, not only for that charity, but for worldwide cancer research. Ladies and gentlemen, David Martin. Well, lovely. I feel soon to be clapping, thank you very much. Um, so, what can I do in 10 minutes to talk to you about leadership? I'm going to manage expectations and say could be not a lot. I mean, let's be honest, leadership is what the most studied and least understood phenomenon on the planet. Um, and I think, uh, following on from my kind of panel here, I'm going to try and say quite practical and just talk to you about me, because it's a topic I know lots about, so it's easy for me to kind of waffle my way through it. And then try and keep this as practical and as relevant as suppose fundraising into the third sector kind of life in the UK as I can. Um, then in the 1960s, a theory of leadership came about, it was called Contingency Theory of Leadership. And this was fundamentally, and following on um, from what we heard at the beginning here, was about the idea that leaders are sort of made by the situation. That you're not just born Hercules and you can sort of solve all, but actually you are kind of, you are a product of your environment. And I suppose the best analogy is if you take somebody, say, like Martin Luther King, if he was born today and then grew up, we probably wouldn't know who he was and never hear about him and he'd just go back to his life in America, but in the 60s, you know, when he was at the head of the civil rights movement, obviously he became that leader because the time was right for someone like that to come forward. Um, and I think, uh, I 
I think that idea, I think, has a huge amount of resonance with, especially life in the third sector, and this idea that actually what we do as individuals, it's all part of cumulative efforts. So if you're a fundraiser, actually, all you do is raise money. You, know, you, don't, you don't cure cancer, you don't solve child poverty or stop them from getting abused, you don't fill, uh, sort of solve famine or anything like this. As a fundraiser, you just raise money. And then you're part of an organisation that hopefully then does something about that issue, that whatever it may be, that you know, whatever charity you work for. And now, that issue itself, you might save one child from abuse, you might you know, kind of cure one type of cancer or increase livelihoods by sort of a few years. And that doesn't change society, but it's a little improvement. It's a cumulative effort. And we know, say, as fundraisers, that when we go to work each day, that we're not going to change the world today, but hey, we're going to make a little bit of help. And if we keep chipping away, there, then off we go. And I think, based on that kind of assumption, if you therefore take what do you do as an individual, as a leader, how is that important? Well, for me, this all comes back to what I call so essentially innate personal value. So now what your strengths are, what your limits are, and how you fit into that puzzle. So, yeah, for, let's look at me. So I'm 26, I'm the head of fundraising, World Wide Cancer Research. I know that I'm, well, energy is probably the best way to describe what I do. I don't know if you notice, I'm kind of struggling at the fact that I'm married behind this table here. I like to move around. I know that my value is all about just getting people energised. Um, when I, before, sorry, before I joined Worldwide Cancer Research, as Andy said, I worked for a charity called Childridge International. It was a start-up, and for us it was all about working with students, young people. You know, we started with 10 grand in the bank and we finished with 4 million in the bank before, three years later. Um, and that was all from essentially starting a bit of a cult. And when I joined the organisation at the moment, um, yeah, income had been flat for seven years. There were four internal conflict resolution issues going on at the time. We had a chief executive with 14 direct reports. We had a board with you know, members on it, and you know, it had been on for over 20 years. I mean, things were, should we say, stationary, it's probably the best way to put it. And if you can remember back to kind of, I suppose, high school, sort of, uh, school science lessons, you've got a stationary object, the only way that's going to move is through kinetic energy. You put enough kinetic energy to feed the atoms on, a, say, a, a ball, so a cup standing on the table, well, that kinetic energy is going to pass through all the atoms, and if there's enough there, the cup will move. So we've got this stationary object, which is now called Worldwide Cancer Research, it was sitting there, and I realised my value and what I could add to that scenario was essentially providing that energy, basically, basically allowing the charity to believe in itself again. Um, and how we do that, as Andy said, we launched this campaign last year called Smarty Pants. This campaign is it's all, it's all around underpants, essentially. Uh, we use cam we can use campaign slogans like the most fun you can have with your pants on. Um, we broke the world record last year for the most number of people ever in a single pair of pants. It's all a bit tongue in cheek, I know, and all a little bit mm -hmm. not sure. So what, what was the point in it? Obviously, the point in it is that this is about going as far outside the charity's comfort zone as could be possibly imagined, short of doing things illegal. The whole point of this campaign is almost a shock tactics from an internal point of view. And what's happened internally is all of a sudden is the staff, the trustees, have started believing in something. Yeah. They've started to think, well, this is all quite fun, actually. And they all started getting involved. And now ideas are starting to flow. And we're starting to raise some money. That's good. But for me, that's almost sort of a means to an end. The end is about getting the organisation moving. It's about their energy. Um, and I know that's where I, as a leader, fit in. And that's what I can provide. And once I've put in enough energy, I'll leave. Because that would be you know, my value spent, essentially. Um, and so knowing that strength, it's also about knowing your limits as well. Um, so at the same time as I launched this campaign, we set up a, what we call a steering group. Because I knew if I just came in there with all these ideas and said, yes, follow me, it probably was going to go unheard of. Because again, I'm only 26 and we've got a board of people who the average age is 40 years older than me and they might not have listened to me. So knowing your limits and knowing my limits and that, we set up a steering group, which is a group of venture capitalists, you know, kind of business psychologists, uh, then marketing directors who launch people like your know, brands like Red Bull. And we went to these people and said, look, would you happily donate your time? And the idea being that this group can then advise on this campaign, use their expertise, and then it's not just my voice, but it's an external voice as well saying, guys, we can change. Um, and that was, yeah, essentially me again, acknowledging my limits, knowing that you can do so much. Um, so I suppose, for me, leadership is, is as we kind of have been talking about, I suppose, all through today, but knowing your place and applying uh, the energy where you can. I suppose everybody in this room has got one thing in common. You've all got a bottom, and you're all quite good at getting off it and doing something. And I suppose my challenge to the room would be with leadership is, now, you may well be just somebody who, I know, you make very good coffee, 
And that might not seem a lot, but actually there are some people as well who cannot function without that caffeine injection in the morning. Now, if you're very good at making coffee, it's your duty to make sure you make that coffee every day and give it to the people who need that coffee because you know, you're all doing your bits. And I know that sounds really huggy feeling, we're probably merging towards a group hug here, I know. But <laughs> everything that we do has a knock-on impact, impact on those around us. And as leaders, our, essentially our job, our role, is about being the best that we can be at whatever you may do. It's not necessarily trying to be run out to the front and say, who are the top chaps? It's about sort of knowing your strengths, knowing your, your limits essentially, and doing everything you can with what you've got in the situation you have it. So, yeah, that's about it really. Thank you very much indeed. So, thank you. Um, having just heard what you've said, I'd like to give you another new title. Um, I, think you're, I think you're a champion of change, actually. A lot of what you've just said there is about um, you know, leaders having to be people who can actually bring about change and champion it. Even when a board and some of your colleagues are maybe at senior level are kind of saying it's not the thing to do. So it's a really brave thing to do. And I think as a leader, something you said about energy as well, that also you're an energizer. I think sometimes we get too hung up on the word leader, actually, because there's so much else that goes around that as well. Thank you very much indeed, Dave. I really appreciate it. Uh, moving on to uh, our final speaker today, uh, Geraldine Kilbride. Uh, Geraldine is a leading coach at the London Business School and the Programme Director here at the Resource Alliance. Uh, Geraldine is a business psychologist, so it's already reading into my body language, trying to understand exactly what I'm going to say next. Um, a specialist in uh, leadership behaviour um, and also a very senior executive coach. Um, she's uh, run one of the Europe's foremost uh, resources for developing leadership talent, which is crucial skills for leaders. Um, she has worked with leaders from a really broad sector of different societies, from Oxford University to Waitrose, uh, one of my favourite supermarkets, as I might say. Um, also, the National Bank of Australia um, to the NHS. Uh, what Geraldine doesn't know about the science and detail of leadership is not worth knowing. Ladies and gentlemen, Geraldine Kibora. Um, um, I come from the dark side. Um, I come from the private sector. So if you're going to throw tomatoes at all, um, they're probably going to be at me. But um, uh, I was introduced as a leadership specialist, and that's my passion. I am intrigued by what makes good leaders versus what makes sort of average leaders or not great leaders. And I think we have had here today, we are privileged to hear the personal stories of people who actually are and inhabit some of the qualities and attributes that actually do make great leadership. Um, but it's interesting to think that, that, that actually leadership is a rare commodity, good leadership is a rare commodity. In fact, um, in the research would demonstrate that probably 50% of people who aspire to be leaders don't cut it. They fail. They're either, they either fail in terms of their KPIs, which is a technical term for the targets that have been set, or they fail within their organisations. And I think it was you, first of all, who talked about the need to inspire followers. So for me, this is intriguing. How do we spot the difference? We are, as people, evolutionarily, and that's a really tough word for town in the morning, geared to seek leadership. We cannot do without it. And in a vacuum, we'll pick people. And I'll talk about how, what signals and characteristics we tend to use to pick those people. But unfortunately, our wiring gets confused. And very often, 50% <coughs> of the time, we don't pick the right people. And, and given time, I'll talk about why we don't pick the right people under various circumstances. Now, I'm going to be a bit technical. I'm going to talk about research. And I'm going to talk about psychology, okay? So try and stay with me because I'm probably wrapping up in eight minutes, minimum 50 years of leadership research. And the bottom line is we don't know. However, we've got strong indicators. That is, we don't know, but we do have strong indicators. And though I would absolutely support the contention that leadership is a social construct, it's not just about the great man and hopefully increasingly uh, just being a woman at the top of either a private sector or a public sector organisation. But actually you need a kickstart. 
And remember I said that we're evolutionarily inspired to seek leaders, so we look for somebody who's going to take us there. Now my argument is, and based on research, there are three, three interconnecting elements that make up a good leader. David thoughtfully and thankfully talked about the situation. That's what you're going into. Secondly, it's what you do in that situation. So what are your key behaviours? And I'm going to list some of them that research demonstrates are critical in this space. But thirdly, and this is where I hold my flag up, it's about personality. Who you are, being and doing, I'm sure you've heard of that differential. What you're bringing into the situation and how you then do things or what you do is very often driven by who you are. So unlike a lot of current theorists, I'm very interested in who you are because I think it conditions what you do, i.e. the effectiveness of your leadership behaviours. Now I'm going to name some of these behaviours later on, which research names about 14 of them. So you can mentally tick them off if you're aspiring to be leaders as I describe them. Do you have them? Do you do these things? Straight yes or no, do you do them? How well you do them, you may need to do some of your own surveys and research to find out. <coughs> Personality theory <coughs> traditionally starts with Coster and McRae, you may argue with me here, David, but talks about the big five personality characteristics. And there is a masses of leadership research which supports these big five personality characteristics as being predictors of success in this field of domain of leadership. How many of you knew that? Thank you. Okay, so you are also aspiring to be a good leader, or you, probably you are a great leader. Oh, brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> Self-confidence, a big indicator of success in this space. Thank you very much. Social confidence. Okay. So the bit, the five are, and the one that always attracts me is called neuroticism. Are you neurotic or not? We don't call it neuroticism anymore, obviously, for obvious reasons. It's not politically correct. But if you're high on anxiety, stress, and tension, you're at one side of that scale, and you need to be thinking about how you control those kinds of behaviours. The second is interpersonal skills. So this is this whole social space. Do you enjoy being with people? Do you like to run people? Do you like to run situations? Are you, are you happier with people than alone in a wood? Those are the kinds of tests. Predictor of success. Third would be openness. What are your interests? How are you inspired? Where do you get your essential fundamental drivers? Are they intellectual, emotional? And I'd say if you're a leader, you have to have some concern for how people feel. And thank you, Andrew, for making that point so clearly earlier. Then we have agreeableness. Increasingly, this facility to actually cooperate, to demonstrate empathy, social intelligence, social awareness, we call it these days, is being proven in a 24-7 environment to be critical to success in this space. And finally, you have to be a bit conscientious. You have to do what you say you will do and your followers are going to be spotting that. Do you talk a good talk, but actually don't deliver? Or are you driven by an appropriate ambition? And I think particularly we've heard some sense of vision and ambition from our speakers this morning, which I would say indicate that they're possibly on the way to being great leaders, if not already. Forgive me for being in that space. Okay, so there's five characteristics, research, the numbers not me, not what I want, the research indicates that these are predictors for success in this space. So, what are the behaviours? And if you come with a personality that sort of more or less um, matches that profile, then what do you have to do with it? Do you want me to list some of the things mm -hmm. research shows? Okay. So, and I think some of these are obvious, and you're going to go, you're telling me that's a leadership behaviour. Planning and organising. Problem solving, clarifying, making that space interpretable and understandable. We live in uncertainty. So you're clarifying your environment for your followers. Informing, you're giving communication, you're telling people what you're doing. You're describing how they will do what they have to do. Monitoring, you don't abandon your organization, you don't abandon your people, you keep giving feedback, you keep giving information. Consulting. It's not about what necessarily, and I think your story this morning, Andrew, about that person who was so driven by their own vision of what they were doing that they left the organization behind. Okay, 
Consulting, recognizing, supporting, managing conflict, big one. Executives I work with consistently fail to manage conflict, and that's a personality trait because it speaks to us about our own fears of being damaged in these kinds of circumstances. I'm sweeping through this, so please, at the end, if there are any questions for clarification that you need. Finally, team building, and we've talked about that. It's not you alone, it's a social construct, so you need a good team around you. Networking, delegating, how many of you are leaders and actually just end up working harder and not effectively delegating and encouraging others to build their own competence. Developing mentoring and rewarding. Easy. And there are persistent, persistent research shows that if you do these things and you can get better at doing them by training and development, you are going to be an effective leader. Okay, so we have some research, we have some behaviours. Surely it's easy. Why aren't we picking better leaders? Why is it still only 50% of the research is pretty stable? Any suggestions? I was Thank you. I was wondering, actually, when you said that, do you yep. the leaders that we choose, perhaps, is indicative of like attachment styles and damaged attachment styles mm -hmm. that then drives us to gravitate towards the wrong people? Very good. Very good. So we are, and I'm going to address four issues in terms of, of how we choose leaders at this point. One of them is, we have this image, we attribute leadership qualities to individuals, it's precisely as you say, and very much, very often they match our own patterning. But also, the, sh the bright side of personalities, socially confident and competent people interview very well. So what we do, and I have to say it's also like any relationship, certainly like most marriages, you hire the bright sunny person or you marry them and woof, then you get, <laughs> you get Frankenstein or the monster and the organisation suffers. Okay, so what can we do? Very often um, when organisations go out to hire, again that attribution, even though we pay very expensive retaining consultants to actually find the right person, retain consultant is really working for the cash, so it's going to, pres it's going to actually, you're going to be signaling the kind of person you want to hire, consciously or unconsciously, and they're going to match that conscious or unconscious brief. So again, you'll find a bright, happy package, and this person you'll hire, or you'll hire based on history. They've done the job exactly as they, somewhere else. But what that fails to take account of is your situation is different. And I think, and I, and I could well be wrong, that the NGO sector is particularly vulnerable to hiring based on past experience, very often in the private sector, and thinking that the situations are entirely replicable, entirely sort of magical, and unfortunately they're not. Because remember I'm talking about a triad of personality, behaviour and situation. The three must be in balance somewhere. Okay, so finally, I'm just going to say we often hire within our own organisation. Research on this is consistent, it's scary, very often we hire within, from within our own organisation, developing succession plans. Of course that's a great thing, that's a, it's a good thing to do. But what we hired you on originally and how you performed, as you go up the greasy pole, the requirements on you as a leader shift and change. And the very often, we as individuals don't shift and change with it. We are who we are. Personality is a fairly stable thing. So we don't adapt, we don't uh, increase our flexibility, we don't listen, and eventually uh, the research currently, again fairly stable, it's probably uh, nearly 30 years of annual research shows that 50% of people who are promoted within won't cut it at levels. If you look at a ladder of leadership of at least five to six levels, they'll fail at level three, as soon as they begin to manage managers, lead managers. Because they're still, it is still about them being bright and capable and largely continuing to do the work themselves. Okay, so what do we need to do? When we're hiring people from outside, what we need to do is a broad range of experiences in terms of, let's get assessment centers, let's do some personality characteristic testing, let's throw situations, role modeling situations at these people and see how they respond. It's not going to give you 100%, but you're going to get probably better than 
And if you're hiring from within, make sure those people, and I know very often we're talking about fundraising in these circumstances, give your key fundraisers different things to do. Spread their experience base. Challenge them like, by putting them in new circumstances, new functional situations, because that breadth of experience increases their mental bandwidth, which increases their predictability for success. Thank you for your patience. Uh, Geraldine, some little snippets I certainly got from that personally was um, the thing we're not alone. <laughs> and I say that uh, we've all got these personality uh, traits as well. Um, that we're always dating, in the sense that we're always kind of we're always on the lookout for for those kind of some of those uh, things as well. And that, that thing about your your, your levels. I mean, we, we talked a lot. Um, there's lots of talk about the kind of we need the level five leaders with personal humility and the will to achieve things. But actually, how do you get through the other levels to get to level exactly. five? How do you achieve that? So thank you very much indeed. Um, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, we're running a little bit, but we do have two minutes for questions, and I do mean two minutes for questions. So if you're brave enough and uh, would like to ask a question in the open forum, that's fine. We do have a networking opportunity after this, so um, you know, please do have coffee and croissants and everything you like with any of our speakers afterwards if you'd like a personal question. <coughs> but does anybody like to ask the panel a question, please? Yes. I want to thank you very much for the presentation is amazing. I know you guys come here today. And uh, my question is to all of you, because it is not just one person. After the presentation of Justina, looking at the face value, and uh, my work within the UK and Africa as a whole, like Sierra Leone, a small country, my experience is in there and in there looking at fundraising and especially when people working out there looking at our situation, as you rightly said about the pictures of angels presenting on uh, the networks, be it television or whatnot, the face of Africa is worrying a bit, but it's not that much in me. My fear is about is people talking about my people, I know them better, me doing the job there. I don't have the funds to actually do the job. For people that don't know my people, they don't know, they don't know poverty, they never tasted one, they don't know about FGM. I own go FGM, but I don't have funds for me to do my work. But they're giving them the opportunity to go and do the work. And it's a bit scary about the outcomes. Is there any effective results coming out from it? When you don't have a passion, as you said rightly, the example of the Banado woman out there because of her experiences and the passion in her brought out fantastic results. That's my worry. I'm struggling with it. So it's the, it's the fear of getting to those results. Um, can I ask Andrew, would you like to just address that first? And I'd like to come to just you know. How did you summarise that? The fear of? Um, it's the, it's <laughs> kind of the, the fear of um, not only getting the message out there, but actually people looking at your own teams. Is that right? No, really. It's like you're giving somebody a job to do. Mm -hmm. When he feels it, he knows it. I know it. Mm -hmm. I know what is happening within, and I've got my charity out there, I want to do some work, I don't have the yeah. Yeah. But people out there, they don't feel it, they don't know it, they, they're saying that they have passion to do the work. It's but just the lack of the Yes, yeah, the lack of there. thing, there's uh, no mm -hmm. results coming from. Mm -hmm. yeah. the way they go there, they give the money to the wrong people. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's, that's a very good example of what I was trying to say earlier on about uh, leaders at the top in NGOs having to find a way in which they can create a nucleus of, of change agents right through the organisation at, at every level. And it sounds to me in the environment that you're working in, um, whoever is leading the organisation uh, that you're part of needs to find a way of um, involving a large number of people at all levels, including working uh, in the front line, in shaping the strategy of that organisation, um, and finding a way in you know in which that that knowledge can inform the corporate direction. So it's a good example for me of one person sitting in the centre somewhere will never have all the right answers, but that one person can help steer the creation of a framework and a strategy that, invo that involves 
multiple intelligence. I don't know if that thank helps. You. No, thank you very much. Okay, I think um, the way I understand her question, also being from Africa, also, like I said, I was um, the diaspora ambassador and spokesperson for the EAF campaign. I was in there in the EAF campaign because I had almost, I could say, 360 degrees of what the issues might be in Africa because I am from Africa. I have lived what we were talking about in the EAF campaign about stopping hunger. I have lived hunger. I still have relatives and friends, people very close to me who are still living hunger. Every day I get phone calls about people dying because they um, they don't have enough food to, you know I work in HIV and AIDS and the medication although now we have found uh, a way in which people can comfortably live with the virus this is only working let me say in perhaps in the more developed world in Africa because that medication is very strong you have to have a good nutrition some good nutrition in order for the medicine for your body to be able to take that kind of medication. A lot of people with HIV and AIDS in Africa die from the medication because the medication is too strong for their body, therefore it destroys their liver. They, so they don't die from the virus or the illness, but rather from the medication because it's too strong for them. So I have that kind of understanding, and that is what she's talking about. And this brings it back to my point about cultures, beliefs, and traditions, and matching resources to needs. The, we, recently, we've had a new thing come on the, on the agenda of NGOs, the female genital mutilation. The best people to lead on that would be the women, because they go through that. And also, the people that practice it, sort of do it in believing that it will please the men. And the people, the people in the Western world don't even understand how this thing comes about. So the best people to lead, to lead that kind of uh, agenda would, people from, would be people from communities who have actually lived through that. They know people who have suffered through that. They know how it comes about. They'll be the people who have the, the, the who have the answer in how to resolve that. That is what she's talking about. Because in most cases, you find that we have a lot of NGOs that will come out from the developing world just having read about a problem which they don't even, they have not experienced, they don't understand it just from the books. It is to, her point is that it is different from reading, reading about something in a book as having to live, to live that thing in person, to experience it as a person in your life. There's, there's a passion in the story you've just told there, which kind of answers it yes. but in, a, in, a, in a, such a clear sense. That there's, I think part of that is the passion of the storytelling, which we've uh, alluded to uh, earlier. One, one final question, please. Um, it's a question for Jeremy, actually. Um, and as somebody who is somewhat neurotic and a bit of a control freak, what you were saying about being neurotic earlier was quite interesting. I just wanted if you could explain a little bit more about what's an appropriate and healthy level um, <laughs> 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 My consulting room would be okay. <laughs> 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 Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think that uh, we're all neurotic at, the, at some level. We all have things that we're dealing with. And maybe in the West, they would certainly, and we have refined, if you like, over, over uh, money and neuroses, in a sense, compared with some of the. Um, circumstances that Justine is talking about, but we do have them, obviously. So just to answer your specific question, if people are to the right hand, it's a scale, if people are to the right hand of that scale, but are seemingly forging ahead and capable, then the question I would ask them is, what are the coping mechanisms they're using? And very often people who are highly strong, sensitive to stress, maybe anxiety and worry, if they're making a, a successful life, and a successful or just throw that word out, but a life that they're happy with, very often they have preparation mechanisms. They've thought through, they've planned, they've controlled because what they can't deal with is spontaneity that creates more anxiety. So they will be prepared. Um, and people who are failing in that preparation will be probably uh, seeking help in some way or in clinics. But it's taking a grip of the situation. We're all pluses and minuses. Nobody's perfect. There isn't the, the, the 
perfect profile. In terms of personality, it's understanding what you've got and then how you're going to work with it. And, and that's, I think, the, the message for us all. Thank you very much, Jordan. It's kind of one of those questions, isn't it? Am I new boss? I'm not sure, am I? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, thank you very much indeed for your time. Just before we do finally wrap up, I know Stephen, you want to say a couple of words, would you? Just a couple of words, yeah. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to very quickly just uh, add to the end, just to say thank you first of all to, to everybody who came and uh, I think it was a fascinating discussion. Um, you can't help but notice we keep talking about future leader programmes everywhere and sort of a prospect in your, your pack. Uh, a couple of the speakers talked about it as well. I thought it was worth just quickly saying a little bit about it as well. Um, and I'm very pleased that Geraldine, who is the town speaker, is also the uh, programme director for that programme. And I'm sure that Geraldine will also be able to answer any questions you may have about the course as well. We also have a couple of future leaders, uh, members of the programme for this year, who have joined us as well, so that's very exciting for us. Um, this is the second year of the programme. Um, the programme is designed to look at meeting the career development needs of middle and senior managers that are looking to become leaders in the NGO sector. Um, look, we look at providing a platform to access training and coaching which has been specifically tailored to the part of the, the participants' needs. We start the process with a, a 360 degree feedback survey that looks to build professional and personal profiling. This is then developed with a qualified executive coach, which then enables the participant to deliver their own strengths and weaknesses, to discover, sorry, their own strengths and weaknesses, to develop a personal action plan, and then look at taking their leadership capability onto the next level. A core and very exciting part of the programme is an intensive five-day residential course that we hold at Wilson College at Oxford University. This enables and supports participants to interrogate their individual dimensions of leadership styles and to explore the organisational aspects of leading change and shaping corporate and organisational cultures. One of the unique components of the programme is that participants are also given an individual executive coach, somebody with an extensive experience and somebody who will help them to work on and develop and deliver and implement their personal action plan, not just during the week at Wilson College, but for a 12-week period after, following the residential programme. This alongside the opportunity for intensive networking with a group of experienced global peers really makes this the most amazing opportunity for the right person. Um, in the perspective, sorry, in the pack you'll see a prospectus. Um, I'm not going to bore you with any more about it. What I wanted to do is finish with two one-minute, if it works, two one-minute interviews um, which were with two of the people who took the course last year because I actually think they're by far the best people to tell you how the programme works. Hopefully I'm going to press the right button. There we go. Hi, my name is Sarah Clifton and I am a senior fundraiser for the World Society for the Protection of Animals. Although I decided to do the Future Leaders programme on my own, um, the reason I felt like it was a perfect fit for me was because I work in a different country context, a different context um, than where I learned to become a fundraiser. And I felt like after a number of years adjusting to a new market, it was really time for me to stop, take stock, figure out what I'm doing, what's working, what's not working. And this uh, program has given me a really excellent basis to look at uh, both from my own perspective, but also from the perspective of my colleagues and from professionals, how I can be more effective. Uh, and I've learned a huge amount being here. I think it's been a life-changing experience. Um, one thing that I have learned that I feel like I can go back and do immediately is uh, understand the context I'm working in and change my style to be more effective. Uh, every job is different, every context is different, every organization is different, and I feel like one thing I've learned is how to adjust myself and my style uh, to be more effective in each different context that I work in. My name is Arun Grigorian, uh, I'm the development manager at uh, Hefe International Armenian branch office. I was privileged to uh, participate at the Future Leader Program uh, of Research Alliance, which uh, initially uh, drew my attention and, and seemed uh, uh, very interesting. And actually, it is, um, I guess, a uh, um, 
one of the uh, 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 an opportunity, a perfect opportunity that uh, very, very few times actually can uh, people come across and uh, cross somebody's path. So uh, I was very happy to participate in the program. Uh, all of my expectations are uh, came true, and uh, I believe that this program will help me to uh, to understand leadership better and uh, has helped me to. Uh, to get a better idea of what is expected from a leader and how I can work on myself to become a better leader in the future. And uh, this will have direct impact on my life, personal life as well as professional life um, and my impact as, uh, as a change agent in the development uh, world where I can help a lot more people impact the lives of a lot more, uh, lot more people who really need help and, uh, and uh, and, and, and help these people to, uh, towards uh, uh, improving their lives and uh, creating better welfare. As I say, there was a program in the, in the pack. Please have a look at it. We do have some spaces left. Um, and I would also want to make it clear that this is a global program. Um, so we have participants from all over the world. And uh, so if you have any networks that you'd like to put it out to, please, please do. We do have some travel groceries available if that's the sticking point, but um, any questions, please do give us a shout. We'd be very happy to talk to you about it. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, who said this was a free event? Yes? Did you get it? That was a good, good bit. Well done, Stephen. That's brilliant. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having Three thank yous. Uh, firstly, to the Resource Alliance for putting uh, today on. Thank you very much indeed, and for our hosts as well. Um, a thank you to our speakers, to Andrew, Justina, David, and uh, Geraldine for your insight and your honesty, if I may say, as well. Uh, thank you very much indeed. And finally, a thank you to you uh, for coming today, uh, coming along and hopefully taking something away from it. There are, without doubt, current and future leaders in this room. Um, I think there's only one thing to say, really, and that's go lead. Yes. Uh, please do uh, take an opportunity to have a coffee or a Danish with uh, any of our panel that would be uh, great to have a private chat with you as well. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.